The scripture reading for the sermon today is John 2, 13 through 22. Um, the word of God speaks to us like this. The Jewish Passover was near, and so Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling oxen, sheep, and doves, and he also found the money changer, changer sitting there. And after making a whip out of cords, he drove everyone out of the temple with their sheep and oxen. He also poured out of the money changers the coins and overturned the tables. He told those who were selling doves, get these things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. And his disciples remembered it, with, it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews replied to him, what sign will you show us for doing these things? And Jesus answered, destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days. Therefore the Jews said, this temple took 46 years to build and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered what he had said, that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the statement Jesus had made. This is the very word of God to us. Thanks be to God. God, yeah, thank you. You guys can grab a seat, and as you're sitting down, um, go ahead and open up your Bibles or turn them on. I hope you have your, your Bible with you. Um, and let's head to John chapter 2. Uh, John t- chapter 2. So uh, we are uh, it's still at the beginning of a series in the Gospel of John called Meeting the Real Jesus. And um, you, may, like, you may ask, like, well, why, <laughs> why that? Like, that, that is not a, we are the first church to actually help you meet the real Jesus. The, the intention behind even that title, the Gospel of John, Meeting the Real Jesus, is I think if you'll hang with us, no matter how long, maybe you would say, man, I've been following Jesus for a long time. I was born on a Saturday, and then that Sunday we were in church together, and I just, I, I've been following Jesus for a long time. Like, even if you're there, or you would say, I'm not really familiar with Jesus, or you're like, yeah, I've got a preconceived notion of who Jesus is, and I, I don't know if I believe this stuff or not. Um, I think what you're going to find is as we go through the Gospel of John, if you'll honestly come to the text, Jesus is going to surprise you. He's going to surprise you because Jesus doesn't really fit neatly into the boxes that we really want him to fit in. Just before, just think about this. So just before this, we heard this from Elliot last week. Um, we saw Jesus' first miracle in uh, John 2 one through 12, where he turns water into wine. And he, like, he actually turns it into wine, not grape juice. And there's this incredible wedding feast. And it's the first miracle whereby um, not the people at the feast didn't know that Jesus had done that. Only the master of the feast, the bride and the bridegroom, their family, and his disciples. And he's doing this to show them that he, who he really is. It's the first of his seven sign miracles that we'll see in John. And so there's this massive party and there's feasting and there's good wine and there's good drink and Jesus creates an abundance. Like it wasn't just enough wine for everybody to have like just a little sip, a little taster. There was abundance and Jesus was just incredibly generous, incredibly gracious and then the very next story. So we have Jesus that we're like, ah, man, I love Jesus. He's making wine out of water and let's invite him to every party. And then the very next story in John, he's in a temple throwing tables around. And that's what I say, you know, that, like there are some of you who, um, well, let, let's just say this. Don't forget the purpose of this book. We started the very first sermon, actually in John 20, verse 31, where John, who's writing this, says, this is his purpose. These things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So every story, everything we encounter in the life of Jesus, John is holding out to us that we might meet the real Jesus He's going to challenge us to believe in Jesus and in believing to have life. So as we walk through each of these stories, we've got to say, what is John trying to get me to believe about Jesus? How is he holding Jesus out to me? Because he's holding Jesus out to you as he's like, he's the guy who turns water into wine and is generous and abundant in his gifts. And he's also the one who holds Jesus out that walks into a temple 
gets angry at what's going on and just starts flipping tables. And there are some of you who really like the Jesus who turns water into wine. And then you're like, I don't, I don't as much, I don't as much love the one who's in the temple throwing stuff around. Like, I, I just don't know. That's why I say Jesus just doesn't fit into these boxes. And then there are some of you who are like, I don't really like the, touch, the touchy-feely Jesus, the gentle, meek, and mild Jesus. I like the one who goes in and he just throws stuff around. Jesus got angry. I can get angry too, you know? That's like one of the most common objections when I'll talk with people about how gracious and tender and patient Jesus is. They're like, yeah, but what about when he's flipping tables in the temple? I'm like, we, we have one story of Jesus doing that. And like, I, I think some people's concept of Jesus is that he just walks around and he's like, there's something you love. I'm going to kick that over. Oh, this, I'm going to throw this table over, right? We've got to do the hard work of saying both are the real Jesus. And he's, he, he's not schizophrenic. He's not like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. So the hard work is like, what's the text trying to show us? So let's see what John might be showing us about the real Jesus. Let's look again at verse 12 of chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. So after this, this being the wedding at Cana where he turned uh, water into wine, he went down to Capernaum together with his mother, his brothers, and his disciples. A disciple is a, a follower of Jesus who helps others follow Jesus. And they stayed there only a few days. The Jewish Passover was near, and so Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Um, it's really good as you are reading and studying the Bible to just ask questions. Um, a, a lot of times, like you know, if you've, if you've been around, a, a lot of my sermons are just built around questions, you know, and, and some of that is like, you should ask questions of the text. It's a good way to dig into the text. So a question I would have here is, what's the Passover? What's the Passover? Like he's trying to tell us, Jesus is going to Jerusalem, the Passover was near, near, the Passover was a Jewish feast celebrating God's deliverance of the people of Israel from captivity in Egypt. Um, before this, a long time before this, the people of Israel were for over 400 years, they were enslaved to the people of Egypt. And the Passover is this meal that the people of Israel celebrated to remember the fact that God had, through miracles and signs and wonders, miraculously delivered his people from their captivity to the Egyptians. And we don't have time to get into all that. You can read it in Exodus, but God sends these plagues on the nation of Egypt. And the 10th plague, God says, hey, I'm going to come through. I'm going to stretch out my arm and the firstborn son of everyone here is going to die. But he told the people of Israel, hey, if you will slaughter an innocent lamb and use the blood of that lamb and paint over your doorposts, the angel of death will pass over you and you'll be spared. That's why they call it Passover. It's the Passover feast. So they slaughtered a lamb, an innocent lamb, and that was, again, to cover our sins, to cover our separation. Something that's innocent has to die. We'll get to this. There's, there's a lot of this going on in the text this morning. And it was uh, the blood of the lamb. By the blood of that lamb, the people were saved from devastation. And God sets up this meal that happens every year, this feast, so that they could remember what God has done because the people of Israel, much like you and I, are very quick to forget who God is and what he's done for us. So they have this meal to remind themselves. That's the meal that Jesus is going to Jerusalem to participate in. Next verse, verse 14. He goes to Jerusalem for the Passover. He's going up to the temple. In the temple, he found people selling oxen, sheep, and doves. And he also found the money changers sitting there. After making a whip out of cords... He drove everyone out of the temple and their sheep and their oxen. Like, it, if you're familiar with this story, just picture this happening. Like, you go into the temple, there's sheep, there's oxen, there's people exchanging money. It's loud. It's like a bazaar. It's like a mart. Like, if you've been deployed, you go into those bazaars where you're like, I can get, I can, I, I can get, like, knockoff DVDs of movies that have even, even come out yet, and I can also buy a goat, I suppose, if I want, and like an outfit for my wife, and I, th that type of thing is happening in the temple, in the temple right now. Jesus comes in, he makes a whip out of cords. Verse 16, he told those who were selling doves, get these things out of here. 
Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. Verse 17, and the disciples remembered that it is written, this comes from Psalm, that this was a prophecy, zeal for your house will consume me. And this is just one of those like, man, that escalated really quickly. <laughs> you know, like we got Jesus who's like, oh man, you've run out of wine. You know, he doesn't go into the wedding and he's like, where's all the wine? I'm just going to throw these water things over. He, we got the Jesus who's like, oh man, you're out, you're out of wine. I'm going to turn water into wine. And then he's at the temple and he's just throwing stuff around. And you could just imagine, man, there's doves flying everywhere and feathers everywhere. People are like, who is this guy? Where's my cow? What in the world is going on here? Th- this is the scene, okay? It happens at the temple. It's really important that you understand what the temple is. Because again, John is building this whole narrative. He's telling us this story so that we would believe in Jesus. Or so that we'd at least have, here's who Jesus says he is and what he's done. What's the temple? The temple was the place where you encountered the presence of God. And it was the place where your sins were atoned for. Where your sins were covered. So the temple was this elaborate structure. If you've been following our Bible reading plan together, it's called Read the Book. You can get that on your way out at the welcome table. Um, I think it was this past week, we were in 2 Chronicles, and we heard about Solomon building the temple of God. And so it was this elaborate, ornate, beautiful place where God said, that's where I'm going to dwell in a unique way among my people. And so it was this unique and beautiful building where you went and encountered and worshiped God. And it was also the place because the people of Israel, like you and I, strayed from God regularly over and over and over again. They would have to go to this place and offer sacrifices to cover their sins. And so the blood of lambs and the blood of doves and the blood of oxen was poured out to cover the sins of the people that they may be made right with God. So it's the place where you encounter God. It's the place where you're made right with God. That's where Jesus comes in. There's all this craziness going on, and he just starts. I was, I was wondering. If, nope, my filter kicked in. Okay, he just starts. <laughs> he just starts. If you, if you know me, you know my filter kicked in, and it's good. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, he just starts throwing tables, okay? Um, I don't think it's helpful to say that your filter kicked in, because now everybody's like, what were you going to say? Man, come on. <laughs> hey, Lord. Okay, so... What's happening in the temple is during the Passover and during the Feast of Unleavened Bread that happened after this, the people would come. They'd travel from far around, Jewish people would, and there they would offer sacrifices. But if you're traveling, like, if you're traveling from a long way away, it's really difficult to bring your own sacrifice. And so you could, and this was an offense, an offense to the Lord, you could buy an animal there to sacrifice, to, for the priest to sacrifice to cover your sins. So there were oxen and there were sheep and there were doves. Now, it used to be that this kind of marketplace where you could go buy an animal as your sacrifice was set up across the valley and over on the Mount of Olives. And, you know, probably people are like, well, man, it's not really convenient, and I don't like walking up hills, and that's a long way away, and it's far, and there's no shade, and all that. So they just kind of move that off the Mount of Olives and into this temple area. And then the other thing that was going on is that they were exchanging money. So you would come and to pay your temple tax, which is, again, it was just part of being an Israelite, is you had a, a tax that would help support the work of the temple. And to pay that, you had to pay in a certain kind of money. And so you would come there and exchange your money for temple money. It was just kind of a weird, not very ethical practice. Because people were like, well, for the exchange, we'll charge you this much. This is all that's going on. And I, th- this, this really is important. Now, that's what the temple is. It's the place where you encounter the presence of God and the place where you're made right with God. Why is Jesus so angry? Have you thought, you know, like, because this is the passage that people justify a lot of times. Like, yeah, you know, I'm angry, but I'm not flipping tables over and fashioning, you know, you're like, I get angry with my kids, but to my knowledge, I have never fashioned a whip and just chased them around the house with a whip, you know? It's like, Jesus got more angry than I do. It's a good question. Why is Jesus so angry? I think there's two reasons. He's angry at irreverence for God. 
He's angry that people were taking the holiness of God very lightly and making this place about themselves and convenience for themselves. That's why this market was even moved off of the Mount of Olives and into the temple. It was all about their own convenience. They were taking God flippantly, taking him lightly. The temple was this ornate, beautiful place. I mean, can you, you, you probably, like me, you get to that point in your Bible reading where you hear all the instructions about building the tabernacle or the temple, and you're like, oh my goodness, man, this is what? Well, I don't care how long the, the, the curtain rod is to hang up the temple and why, the gold and all that. What, what in the world? All that is meant to communicate something. God is other than, and he's holy and And like, this stuff matters. And what we need to understand, they did and we do, is you cannot come to God in a flippant way. And you can't come to Him on your own terms. It can't just be like, yeah, I'm going to come when I want to and how I want to. This is the problem Jesus has. Kent Hughes says this, irreverence toward God is only a symptom of an idolatry. This is so important an idolatrous image of God that is man-made. He says, our reverence from God is actually a symptom of something deeper, and that's that we have a tendency to make an idol out of God himself. To say, I'm going to just make God into my own image or into an image that I, can, that I can handle. Dry ritualism indicates that our God is far away and dead. Joyless performance reveals an arid deity. But on the other hand, reverence for God indicates our belief that he is great, awesome, and powerful. Joyful worship makes known the living God. Some of us can't comprehend a Jesus who would disagree with us. Or a Jesus who would say, your worship of God is not right you are coming to God in an unholy way. We can't comprehend that. That's why I say, like, meeting the real Jesus, he just doesn't fit into our boxes. We're like, well, you know, my church is when I'm out in the woods, or I feel closest to God when I'm doing this, you know, and we, we just, we treat following and worshiping God like a choose-your-own-adventure book. Did you guys read these? I, man, I miss these books. Um, growing up in school, it was the choose your own adventure books. And, you know, you'd get to the, the story would be like, does he dive off the cliff or does he turn around? And you're like, dive off the cliff. And then it's like, flip to page 88. And you're like, oh, you're dead. No, I didn't take my finger out. I'm going <laughs> to, I did, seriously, am I the only one who like read? I love these books. But we'll treat following God that way. I was like, man, I get to just kind of choose what I want to do, what I don't want to do. And you know, I, I, w- I was at this conference, and um, there's this really well-known, really well-known worship leader who um, she was talking, and I, I don't want to use her name because it people would know, but she was talking, and I remember her saying, like, my concept of God is like this, and it was just jarring. And, people, and she's like, you know, I kind of picture the Holy Spirit like he's the genie in Aladdin, and, uh, you know, he's, and I was just like, that's not okay. I think that's an extreme example of what we have a tendency to do, though. I was like, well, my Jesus would never disagree with me. My Jesus would never ask me to lay down something. My Jesus would never ask me to sacrifice something. My Jesus, man, he's concerned with my comfort and all this. For many, worship is a selfish thing. This is what's going on in the temple. We're like, it's not convenient, God, to worship you like you want to be worshipped. So we're just going to make things a little bit easier for us. For many of us, and I've been there too, worship can be a selfish thing. It's like, man, I, I want it to be like this, and I really prefer this kind of music, and, um, and, and I really prefer this length of sermons, and so I, you know, I'll give you an hour to be in here from start to finish, but I don't, you know. Like it reveals our irreverence towards God, and it's one of the reasons Jesus is angry here. D.A. Carson says, Jesus' cleansing of the temple testifies to his concern for pure worship, a right relationship with God at the place, the temple, supremely designated to serve as the focal point of the relationship between God and man. 
what Jesus is angry about too. Like it's, it's more than just doctrinal zeal. Because th- this is the type of passage that I've heard people use to like, well, man, reform people or Calvinists or Arminians. Oh, I just, I just can't stand them and I want to go flip their tables and I just have the zeal like Jesus does. It, it's, not, mm, it's not doctrinal zeal that just gives you a pass to just be angry with whatever you don't like. Like, we don't need more angry, arrogant theologians. He's upset at a reverence for God, but it's not just a reverence for God. I think the second big thing that he's really upset about is a religiosity that keeps people from God. I think he's upset because people were irreverently coming to God. But I think, I think and, and I think potentially maybe even the primary reason Jesus is angry is there was a religiosity that kept people from God. Now, let me, let me show this to you. This may be difficult to see. This is a picture of the temple. You have these like different courtyards in the temple. So you have that courtyard on the outside. That was the Gentiles courts, non-Jewish people. And then just inside that first wall, you, uh, that first wall, you have the women's courtyard. And then inside that, you have the priest's courtyard and then the Holy of Holies. So you have these like different walls between these different sections. What was happening during this time is this market was happening in the court of the Gentiles. And there is, um, there, there's a sign that's been found from the temple during this time that was a warning to Gentile, non-Jewish people, that said, if you enter this place that is for just Israelites, uh, it, essentially it was like, enter at your own peril. Like, you're going to die if you do this. So God had actually, the way that he designed the temple to work was that there would be a place where Gentiles, non-Jewish people, could come and encounter the presence of God and have their sins paid for. And it was that courtyard that the people had set up this market in. So think about what's happening. God has intended that that would be the place that people could encounter the presence of God and that people could have their relationship with God made right. And as those people come, they meet a barrier of people selling stuff and exchanging money that kept them from the presence of God. That's what Jesus is upset about. That kind of religiosity that puts up a barrier and keeps people away from God. That says you may come this far, this far, but no further, right? This is, it's really important to get this. What was happening in that place is the place where non-Jewish people could come and have their relationship with God made right and encounter the presence of God. The Bible said, like God says, hey, my, my house will be a house of prayer for all people. Not just Israelite people, but non-Jewish people also. And in the place that God intended for them to be able to worship God and pray, that's where there's sheep and oxen and money changing, like a really non-ethical thing going on. And Jesus comes in and he's like, this isn't good. And I think you should see the lengths Jesus will go to to overturn, overturn and remove what keeps you or others from him. He's really concerned about this. For some people, it's, it's like, it's a smug attitude. It's like, well, you don't. Doctrine and theology matters, but we have a tendency to take secondary issues and make them primary issues. We're like, well, you, you're not Reformed, or you're not Arminian, or you're not Calvinist. And if you're like, that's all weird, I don't know what any of that is. You are Probably, probably better off. But the smug attitude that's like, no, unless you read the version of the Bible that I do, unless you dress the way that I want you to dress in church, and unless you go, like, you watch that movie? Oh, no, I don't, I don't like that. You homeschool your kids? You don't homeschool your kids? We have a tendency to do all these things to create a barrier between God and people. And Jesus comes in and says, it's not good. And we would do well to say, God, where are these places in my heart? That Jesus would come in and say, like if there's a type of people that you turn up your nose at. I mean, just think about it. If there was anybody who walked in that door wearing anything, like if there's anybody that you'd be like, oh, no, 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 we don't want those kind of people here. 
There may be some tables in your heart that Jesus wants to turn over. That's the scene. Okay. Now let's come back to this scene. I want you to picture This has just happened. You've been standing there. I mean, there's cows running. <laughs> there's cows running around. There's sheep running around. There, I, I mean, there's, there's doves flying everywhere. There's feathers. You can probably hear because of what the floor was made of, you can probably hear the table still clattering a bit and money like change because it wasn't dollar bills. It was actually coins. They're clattering. Everyone's like, what is happening? That's the scene that, this is where we pick this up. The religious leaders, they show up. This is, this is what happens next. Verse 18. So the Jews replied to him, to Jesus, what sign will you show us for doing these things? which is interesting. They're not like, what are you up to? <laughs> what are you doing, right? They come in and they say, oh, like what, what's going on here? And then they ask Jesus for a sign to show them by what authority he can do this, which is interesting because there's at least a smidge of belief that maybe Jesus has the authority to be doing what he's doing. Because it's just like a brazen thing. This was not like an everyday occurrence, you know. People in the temple were like, on it, man. Somebody came in and threw tables around again. We got to get a better security guard out there, you know. <laughs> like, they're like, okay, I don't like this. It doesn't seem right. Just in case you're a prophet, would you show us a sign? They believe maybe he was. Now, Jesus isn't going to appease them. He doesn't fit into the boxes we, create, we tend to create for him. Here's what Jesus said. And just think about that. I mean, just, we get so familiar with these stories that it's hard to put yourself in this situation. Jesus just thrown tables everywhere. There's animals going all over the place. You're like, hey, by what authority, like, what gives you the right to do this? And Jesus says, destroy this temple and I'll raise it up in three days. It's kind of a weird answer, right? Like, ah. Uh, Okay, so it goes on, verse 20. Therefore the Jews said, uh, this temple took 46 years to build and are you going to raise it up in three days? Like, it took a whole lot of people 46 years to build this thing and you're saying you're going to, like if we tear it down, you're, you'll re rebuild it in three days. Which is, a, like, that's a normal question. I think it's easy for us with the religious leaders to be like, oh man, why? I can't believe they would ask Jesus that. That's a normal thing, you know? Like, uh, to be frank, if somebody came in here, started throwing stuff around, and I was like, hey, welcome to Frontline. We're glad you're here. But why are you doing that? And they were like, well, tear this building down. I'll rebuild it in three days. You know, I'd be like, what? That's, that's a weird thing, right? Verse 21, John helps us. But he was speaking about the temple of his body. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples, followers of Jesus, remembered that he had said this and they believed the scripture and the statement that Jesus had made. This is the first time in the Gospel of John that Jesus predicts his death. So they think he's talking about this like physical temple. They're like, you're going to tear it down and then rebuild it in three days. And John says... Jesus wasn't actually talking about that. He was talking about the thing that the temple pointed to. He was talking about his body. And he's looking forward to the day when he would be crucified, put to death, put in the earth, be dead for three days, and then be raised from the dead. And it says, like, in that moment, it's not like his disciples. So, like, hey, if you struggle with doubt and faith and these things like that, you can find yourself in good company because the disciples aren't in that moment. Like, yes, we totally believe it. They probably were like, that, I don't understand what he means. What does that do? And then we, then like John puts in this, this kind of a, a, a authorial like uh, explanation here where he says, when Christ was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he'd said this. That he said, this is what I was going to do. And they believed the scripture and the statement that Jesus has made. Jesus is speaking about the temple of his body, which meant the temple and what the temple stood for is pointing to something different. And Jesus is saying in this moment, the temple points to me. So let's go back to those couple questions. This is why it's so important to ask questions of the text. What is the purpose of the temple? It's the place where you encountered the presence of God 
And it's the place where your sin was atoned for and you were made right with God. Now, there's this really interesting wordplay going on here. I do, I do this because I love, I do, I do love to nerd out over, over this kind of stuff. There's an interesting wordplay going on here. So I think we got a picture of this temple again. Okay. There's two different words used for temple here. Verse 14, um, can you pull up that next slide of the, of the verses? I forgot to write it down. I think there's one. Yeah. So verse 14 says, in the temple he found people selling. Then verse 19 says, Jesus answered, destroy this temple, and I will raise it up in three days. Now, you can go back to that picture of the temple. So two different words being used there. That first word was primarily used to refer to the entire complex of the temple, so all the different courtyards. The second word, the the word that Jesus used when he says, destroy this temple, and I'll raise it up in three days, was primarily used to refer to only one specific place in the temple, and that's the Holy of Holies. In the Holy of Holies was the place where God's presence dwelt in a unique way. There was only one person who could go into that place, and it was only one time per year, just the high priest. He could go into that place after a perfect sacrifice had been made, and only one time per year. So the whole temple was holy, but as you progress closer and closer to the Holy of Holies, you get closer and closer to the actual presence of God. And in that temple of holies, there was this massive curtain that was made. And God intended that that curtain would be made to separate his presence, holy, perfect God, from the presence of sinful people like you and I. Because sinful people cannot be in the presence of holy God. And so there was this massive curtain. So Jesus, I'm track with me. Jesus is like, the temple's pointing to who I am. And he says, destroy this temple. In three days, I'll, 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 like, this is going somewhere. Those two words being different, really important. First word, the entire temple complex. Second word, Jesus uses just that inner holy of holies. On the cross when Jesus dies, this is what Matthew tells us, Matthew 27, 50 to 51. Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and gave up his spirit. This is when Christ died. He's been killed by the Roman people, hung on a cross. He dies. Verse 51, suddenly... The curtain of the sanctuary, the Holy of Holies, that was right there, was torn in two from top to bottom. The word that's used there is a really specific word because Matthew wants you to understand. It wasn't just torn from like, it got a fray in the bottom and then somebody came along and started pulling on a thread and we're like, oh no, the curtain torn in two. There was a specific word used that meant torn not from bottom to top, but from top to bottom. What Christ does at his death as the true and greater temple, is tears apart what separates you from God. Christ himself goes into the Holy of Holies as the true and greater sacrifice that all the sacrifices the people would offer over all the time that they were in the temple, all of those sacrifices point beyond themselves to a better sacrifice. And that's what John saw when a couple weeks ago we saw in John 1.29, John the baptizer, when he said in John 1.29, the next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and he said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He's saying the sacrifice, that all the sacrifices of oxen and sheep and doves that people have offered and continued to offer, they all point beyond themselves to a once for all sacrifice. And Jesus himself becomes the presence of God to us, the thing that the temple pointed us to. The problem with the temple is you had to go there over and over and over and over again, year by year by year by year. You had to offer sacrifices over and over and over again. And what the temple was and what those sacrifices were were temporary sacrifices to point to a final, greater, true, once-for-all sacrifice. This is what the author of Hebrews gets at. I know, I, like hang with me. I know we've been like, my goodness, we're here and then we're here and then we're, we're here. I'm stoked about it, as you can tell. Okay, Hebrews 10, verse 10. The author of Hebrews is talking all about this temple that Jesus has just gone into. He's flipped tables. There's sacrifices going on. The author of Hebrews is, is talking about those sacrifices that would happen in that temple. And he says, and by that, and then he says like Jesus is the truer sacrifice. And by that will, we have been sanctified or, or made holy, made right with God 
through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And every priest stands daily at his service offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins because they don't last. You'd have to offer a lamb and then do it again the next year and then do it again and then do it again. But, verse 12 of Hebrews 10, when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. When the Bible says that Jesus sat down at the right hand of God, that's a position of authority and finality. Jesus sat down because the work was done. Priests didn't do this. Priests would have to continue to offer sacrifices over and over and over again. Christ, as he offers himself as the sacrifice to end all sacrifices, to cover the sins of the people of God, he goes and he sits down at the right hand of God. Verse 14, for by a single offering, he has perfected for all times those who are being sanctified. Verse 19, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, Jesus, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. When the author of Hebrews says, let us draw near, like that was crazy in the mind of an Israelite because that place that Jesus says, like tear down this temple, my body, and I'll rebuild it in three days, the holy of holies that represented the unique presence of God, that was a place that when the priest went into that place, he did not, even the priest did not go in with confidence, full assurance. The priest had to go into that place with a cord wrapped around his ankle because if he went in in an improper way, like the people were worshiping God in an improper way in the temple, if he went in in an improper way, God would kill him on the spot. That's how seriously God takes his holiness. And they tied a cord around his ankle because like if other people went in there, it would be like a let the bodies hit the floor moment. Like they're just stacked upon stack. So they would tie a cord around his ankle so that if he died and they're like, oh, he didn't go in there in the right way, they could pull him out. Not everybody would die. And the author of Hebrews says, Jesus has done something that makes us able to approach the presence of God, not with a cord tied around our ankle, not with fear, like, man, maybe I'm, not, maybe I'm not right. Maybe I've done, maybe I haven't have confessed enough sins. Man, I've, I, like, I, I really blew it last night. I don't, know, I don't know if I can go. Jesus says, no, no, no. That temple curtain has been torn into through the perfect sacrifice, not of you, but of Christ himself. In the like, where do we go from here moment, belief. It's belief. This is what Jesus, this is what John is doing. He's just holding out to us, man. The temple where the presence of God is and where you're made right with God, all of it pointed to Jesus. He's both cleansed the temple and negated the need for the temple. And he invites you to come into the presence of God imperfect as you are and as I am through his perfect sacrifice, his perfect body broken, his sinless blood shed. This is one of the reasons that we celebrate communion every week. If you're wondering, what does it look like to come into the presence of God rightly? I don't know if I'm coming right. Am I not coming? I don't know if I've done enough. Have I done, am, I, am I okay? Are God and I okay? I don't know if I... Uh, there's a story of Martin Luther where he would like confess his sins for three hours every single morning. He had this habit where he'd confess sins and then he'd walk away from confession. He'd be like, oh man, I remembered some more that I need to go confess. And in that I find... Like, I can do that a lot, and I can think that my standing with God depends on how well I confess or don't confess my sins. 
only way to approach the presence of God is through the sacrifice of God. 